There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. And fear is a liar with a smooth and velvet tongue. Fear is a tyrant, he's always telling me to run. Love is a resurrection, love is a trumpet sound. Love is my weapon, I'm gonna take my giants down. Ain't no grave. my body down uh, I will tell you that uh, we have done this all over the world we have been teaching this seminar uh, publicly for about the last 25 years roughly uh, when we started things were vastly different if you came into the church or into Christianity in the last 10 15 years uh, you might not know how it was before but it was vastly different. And uh, there's a lot of the things that we have taught around the world. We have taught uh, well over, I would say now, I'm trying to think, uh, probably, yeah, at least uh, around, somewhere around 700, 800,000 people around the world. That's on every continent. Uh, that's in 42 countries. And so it, it, by doing that everywhere, it causes the temperature of the body of Christ to rise and now things that we used to have to really blast to get through are just people say, oh yeah, well that's the way we do things. And so we're excited about what God's going to do with this, uh, this new year, the first seminar of this new year. And so this is a good start. Amen? Amen. Uh, I believe at last count we had about 450 registered. Uh, so it's going to be interesting this week. <laughs> so, but uh, we do have plans. We are looking uh, toward the future, I'm uh, just to throw this out there real quick. I'm not going to go into detail, but we are uh, actively looking for property in the area. Uh, but we want it to be slightly on the edge of, of town or a little bit further out if we can, uh, where we will have the Bible school, we'll have a church facility, and we will also have a center that is specifically designated for divine healing. Uh, out of that, it'll be divine healing teaching every day, and there we are looking at actually having dorms for our Bible school students, and near that would be actual something. We're not sure yet whether it be like apartments or cabins. I prefer cabins. Uh, that would be where people that are uh, either terminally ill or have other situations going on can actually come and stay and be ministered to until they are well. Uh, so now, um, so that's, that's our plan. We're looking toward that now. We're praying about it, seeing how it can work out. Uh, this is actually very similar to something that A.A. A. Allen did uh, back in the 40s, 50s, actually moving into the 50s and 60s. Uh, he actually put together what was called Miracle Valley out in Arizona, which is about 10 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. And he had facilities there. He had actually a small hospital built there. There was an uh, airplane runway there. People would fly in. They would come in with their doctors. He actually had doctors on staff. Uh, that watched the people and took care of them until the healing service and then he would minister to them and then the doctors would be able to verify if they were healed or not. And so that is our, uh, our heritage, you might say, uh, as part of what God is doing in divine healing and we would like to see that continue. One of the main reasons it hasn't continued up to this point, uh, twofold, number one, a lot of legalities started being uh, enacted and the more legalities that were enacted, the more cowardly Christians got. And so it's time that people start standing up and actually start doing what is necessary uh, to, to act, amen, so that we start actually being able to uh, make a stand for our beliefs, because I will tell you, if we don't, 
our practices will be taken away. Yep. So it's headed that way right now. There is not a country on earth where socialism has had a good, strong footing that uh, Christianity was not at least attempted to be stamped out. And if you look around, America is on that path. And so uh, yeah, we need to be able to make sure that we can practice our faith the way the Bible tells us and that no one has the right to tell us we can't. Amen? Amen? So, all right. Well, we are, hopefully you have all the material that was handed out, uh, the waivers and everything. Uh, please get those filled out. As I said, we'll pick those up at the end. Uh, we'll run sessions about 45 minutes approximately. Okay. <laughs> Uh, don't hold me to that. I try to stay at that, but, uh, you know, if uh, something's going on, I try not to interrupt that, all right? So, now, who has attended, a, a, actually attended a DHT before? You've been at one before? Oh, great. Okay, let's do it this way. How many have never attended a DHT? Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's, that's an entire new brigade, okay, <laughs> that's, that's being launched. <laughs> that's what I'm looking at, so. That's awesome. That's good. All right. Well, uh, how many, now we're going to go through a couple of these things. How many are sick and you came because, mainly because you need healing, Pre predominantly because you need healing? I mean, you're going to learn healing, but that's a, okay. All right. Well, we, healthy ones, I think we got you outnumbered. I think we can, I think we can take care of you pretty quick. Amen. So, uh, secondly, how many of you are not sick, you don't need healing, but you came because so maybe somebody in your family, somebody you know, something has grabbed your attention. Maybe they were sick. Maybe someone has passed away. And it has grabbed your attention, and you want to be able to do something about it. Amen. Good deal. Good deal. All right. Well, you came to the right place. As I said, we have taught hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And the beauty of it is because it is simply Bible, it works everywhere. Amen. And everywhere that people have put this into practice and actually do it, we get results. We get the testimonies from the results. Matter of fact, while we were speaking last night, we had uh, a, a text before we, were, we had our Wednesday night class. And before that, I had a text uh, of a baby that was in very serious condition. And just before uh, I started ministering, I got the text that the baby had died. And, and so they said, you know, please pray. We're believing for this baby to be raised. And so we prayed. We agreed. And then whenever... We went, by the time we finished praying, went back and it said, he's alive. Woo! Amen. So, and there's other testimonies that have happened even recently that we'll be telling you about. Uh, but the primary thing is not for you to come and hear testimonies, just testimonies. Obviously, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. But that's not all you came for because we want to give you the nuts and bolts of how to work this. A lot of people say, well, you, you know, you can't teach divine healing. You can't train people how to minister in divine healing. You're absolutely wrong, right? We've done it. We've seen it. People do it. And how do you, why do you think Jesus discipled his disciples? It was to train them to do what he did. And he did three things. He taught, he preached, and he healed, right? And so if we're going to be his disciples, we have to be able to do the same thing. Amen? Amen. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right, all right. Well, all right, now. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah. Actually, well, if you have your manual, you can see on probably on page two there, uh, at the close to the bottom, it says that Jesus never taught healing in the sense that we see it in the Bible. Now, he taught about healing. He taught different things, but he never technically actually taught healing per se. What he taught was kingdom, and the gospel of the kingdom to be specific, and he taught relationship with the Father. And when you have a relationship with the Father and you understand how the kingdom works, you will operate in healing, right? It's just that simple. Now, and the thing is, anybody can do this, right? We have had, I think our youngest DHT was eight. Yeah, uh, eight-year-old child sat on the front row, took notes. You know, I thought they were drawing and they were actually taking notes. And, and then there was a young man, actually he was, about, I think, 11 at one time, came to a, a DHT here and then went back home to his church uh, at the end of their Sunday morning youth service. He said, can I pray for any sick kids here? And his teacher said, yeah, yeah, do that. And they started getting healed. And so the testimony went to the pastor, and the pastor said, what's going on? And so then he went, and, and they said, we went to this seminar, and this is what he learned. 
and he's, the pastor said, that's, that's amazing, so you're praying for people. He said, yeah, he said, you want me to pray for people, uh, you want me to pray for the adults tonight? He's 11 years old, right? <laughs> and the pastor said, you know, that's a good idea, why don't you just do that? And so that night, they had, at their Sunday evening service, they had this young man, and he, he taught, I don't know how long he taught, but he taught on healing in the atonement. And taught them and then ministered to the adults. He had to stand on a chair so he could lay hands on them. <laughs> so, so, and, and people started getting healed and getting healed and getting healed. And pretty soon they started investigating uh, what seminar he had gone to. And then they started partaking of it also. Amen. So uh, that was our two youngest. And then I think our oldest was, I think, 93. 93? 93, I think it was. And they said their only regret, because it was working. They were going out, praying for people, ministering to people. And, and, and honestly, if you're 93 years old and you ask, can I pray for you? Nobody's going to say no, right? <laughs> and so, but, and, and, and it was amazing because they wrote back and they said, here's our testimonies. Here's what's been going on. And they said, my only regret is I didn't find you sooner and didn't get this sooner. That's it, right? My only regret is I didn't start sooner. What I know, not all of it, of course, but what I knew to get started I knew probably a good 10 years before I got started. And my only regret was I didn't start. And the only reason I didn't start sooner is because I had a bunch of people saying, that can't be right. If it was right, everybody else would be doing it. You know, how, what makes you think you're right? And I kept saying, because I got a Bible and, <laughs> and I can read. Yeah. There you go. So, right? So, anyway, uh, we're going to be looking at these things. There's only two things you really need to know. This is on page three. Only two things you really need to know. Number one, is healing always God's will, right? That's the first thing. Now, it's one thing to go, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's always God's will. It's another thing whenever you're confronted with sickness and disease and different situations, and you have to be able to stop and go, no, it's always. Well, what about? No, no, what about? It's always God's will. Well, yeah, but they opened the door. Yeah, but they did this. Or yeah, well, what about? No, no, always God's will. Why? Because it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance, right? If they need to change, they can change after they get healed, Amen. right? Amen. Jesus never dealt with a non-sinner. Think about that. Jesus never dealt with a Christian, <laughs> right? If he did, he'd have, he'd have been a whole lot more, uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, number two. Did God command believers to heal the sick? Because if you know these two things, if it's always God's will, and if God commanded believers to heal the sick, then really the only thing we have to do from there is say, okay, how? What do we do? Because those two things answer everything else, right? That means there's no excuse why we don't minister to the sick anywhere, everywhere, all the time, as we always say, help and healing for anyone, anywhere, for anything. Right? And so if you know those two things. Now, if you removed past experiences and any teaching that negates the scriptures, there would be no more hesitation or doubt about healing and deliverance than there is about salvation. Right? The only reason people are as solid about salvation as they are is because they've had it drilled into them that God will save anybody. And if I can drill it into you that God will heal anybody, you'll see a lot more people healed. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So we're gonna, that's what we're going to do this week. Now, the, and the beauty of what we're doing this week is that, and, and this is probably the biggest thing, especially, you know, I asked how, how many of you had attended a DHT, but many of you have probably even maybe heard it online that you hadn't attended one, but you've heard it. And so some of these things, obviously, you'll hear it again. But the key to this is this, and you may have heard me say this already. <clears throat> most people, most Christians, uh, come up with things <coughs> such as new anointings, new, you know, impartations, different things, this, and they keep saying, well, to walk in this, you got to have this, and well, you need this, and well, you need that, and you got to have this, and they keep coming up with new stuff you got to have to make it work, and the reality is this, and see, most of the time we think, well, I, I don't know enough, I don't know this, I don't know that, and what about this, and, and that can be true, but it's generally, the Christians that I've dealt with, that's not the problem, see, your problem is not that you don't know enough, your problem is you know too much of the wrong things, right? And because of that, you have doubt and unbelief when you ought to have faith. And the real problem with that is you learn doubt and unbelief in church. You don't learn it on the street, right? Nobody learned about Paul's thorn at the bus stop. 
right? You had to go to church to learn about Paul's thorn and to hear about Timothy's stomach. And, you know, Paul left somebody sick somewhere sometime. They, they can't remember who or where, but it's in there, you know. <laughs> anyway, so what we do is we spend the next three days, and, and really, well, right here you'll see this. There is a, where is it at here? Try to find it. Well, don't see it here. But anyway, what Jesus said was he said, it is by your traditions that you make the word of God of none effect. Now, these traditions are the traditions of men. The Bible call them traditions of men. And then there's also what the Bible calls doctrines of devils. And usually the tra traditions of men and doctrines of devils are the same thing, right? Very often, maybe not always. Now, there are some traditions that we are told to follow. But then there's other traditions that negate the word of God that we have to get rid of. Now, what we do is we call these traditions of men, that's the biblical term, but we tend to refer to them as sacred cows. And the reason we call it that is because a sacred cow, for instance, India, different places like that, you will have people sitting on the side of the road starving to death and cows walking past them, and they will not kill them and eat them because they're sacred. So they would rather let people die than to kill their sacred cow to feed the people, right? Well, I don't know if you noticed or not, but you're in Texas. <laughs> we know how to kill cows, okay? And, and we're, that's what we're going to do this week. We're going to spend the next three days just killing all the sacred cows. And whenever you get all these traditions of men, these sacred cows out of the way, all that's left is the word of God. And guess what? It works. Isn't that amazing? So it's not the, the things you don't know that really hinder you walking in power. What hinders you is the fact that you believe things that aren't right. And that's called unbelief. See, unbelief is not just not believing. Unbelief is believing the wrong thing. Right? Nobody doesn't believe anything. I know that's a double negative and all that, but what, basically what I'm saying is this. There's nobody that doesn't have a belief system. The problem is what they believe is wrong. So our job is to get the beliefs right, and if you get the beliefs right, then God can flow through you, and you'll, ele you'll let him, and then his power can be displayed. Amen? Amen? Until every Christian walks like Jesus in every area, including nature, character, temperament, power, healing, miracles, until that, we are not where God wants us to be. All right? And I would even say what Jesus said, even beyond that. Even beyond what we can see in the Bible. He said, well, I don't see that in the Bible. Great. It's a greater work. Let's, let's go beyond that. All right? I'm not saying get weird and get out of the Bible parameters. Yeah. But when people say, well, I've never heard of something like that. Okay, I, I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, let's see, yeah, that picture right there on that wall with the, on the far right, the fairly good size one there, all the metal. That's about three pounds of surgical steel metal that I was in Colorado and I prayed for a lady. Uh, she had back problems. Laid my hands on her back, commanded her back to be healed. Didn't know anything about the metal. She went home, went to sleep, woke up in the morning. That was lying in her bed under her. Seriously, came out of her back, no clue how. Doctors could not say how, they, they checked the numbers. All those things have numbers on them. And they checked the numbers and said, this is what we put in your back, but there's been no surgery, so we don't know how it got out. Right? And it was lying in her bed. Now, if they had told me she had metal, I'd have prayed for her healing, but uh, you know, honestly, the metal might have stayed in. But because I didn't know, right, then I just prayed, be healed. And to be healed, that stuff had to come out, right? So it's not that we have to know every detail of how it works. It is knowing that God can. But I will tell you this. You can look all you want. You're not going to find metal coming out of a person's back in the Gospels. Amen? So that's a greater work. Amen? Okay, that's just one. All right. So, and we're going to talk about different things this week. Now, um, actually... 45 minutes goes quick because we're almost already there. You'll notice on page six. Now, these are just facts, but then the reason I'm telling this is because I want you to know what we've done. We've taught this around the world. It works. There's no question about it. I'm not here giving you theory. I promise you that what you learned this week, I have done and others have done. If it was just me doing it, then we would say, well, maybe it was a gift or some people call it an anointing or whatever. But everything that I'm going to tell you about, not only have I done, but other people have done it. 
which proves it's just faith in the Word of God. Faith in, it's faith in the Word of God and faith in the God of the Word. Amen? Amen. And, and anybody can do it. Any believer. He that believes. Not apostles, not prophets. No, he that believes the same works Jesus did, they will do, and greater works. Amen? So this is about believers. So basically, we are taking this from Mark 16 is one of them. And if you have a problem with Mark 16, especially 15 through 20, we'll talk about, during the, talk about it during, this, during the uh, course. But I will tell you this. We're basing this off of the lowest common denominator. This is not a seminar about gifts, even though gifts will function and we will talk about how they function. But the emphasis is simply this. You're going to learn about God's will for healing, and you're going to learn how to minister healing, and we're going to take away all of your reasons for not doing it so that you just have to decide to become obedient. How's that? Amen? So that's what we're going to do now. So I'm, and so I'm telling you these things here, uh, not in a way of, you know, arrogance or bragging or anything, like that kind of thing, but you need to know these are the facts, right? This ministry is the oldest healing ministry in existence, right? Uh, it predates the Assemblies of God as an organization, right? It was birthed before that. As a matter of fact, John Lake was at uh, the formation of the Assemblies of God in, in 1914, and he'd already been ministering healing from, well, actually from about 1893 all the way up. So there are no other ministries in existence today uh, that are healing ministries. But about the closest is actually, uh, well, the Assemblies are good or in, the, in the sense of close in how long they've been around, but also uh, the Four Square Church, uh, Amy Simple McPherson. Uh, she was also uh, ministering early, uh, a little later than John Lake, but at about the same time. Actually, there's some pictures of her over there, too, I think. Yeah, that's her right there, right next to the metal, in the middle. That's her, I think, standing over a bed uh, where she's praying for people. So I've been to all these places, looked these people up, talked to people that knew them, investigated, proving out what we teach. Everything I teach you uh, is not based on hearsay. It's based on Bible. Amen? Amen. Remember, the devil doesn't answer to Brother Curry said. <laughs> he answers to, it is written. Amen. Amen? Amen? And so that's what we want. We want to make sure you know it is written. Now, uh, J.G. Lim, John G. Lake Ministries, is the oldest healing ministry in existence. We have more documented healings than any other ministry in history. We have the highest success rate, that means percentage-wise, of healing in ministry today. No other ministry literally comes anywhere close. Uh, on the average, anywhere from, it can vary a little bit, but generally anywhere from about 88% to about 98%, 97% of, of every type of person, uh, every type of disease is healed. Uh, the nearest ministry to that, uh, in, in ministries that are out there doing this, that have not more or less adopted the biblical message that we share, uh, usually they're about 23 to 25%. So it shows, and that's ex exactly where I was when I started, and then literally overnight, we saw about a 50% jump just by tweaking a couple of things that I found. So, uh, and the good thing is, God intends for you to start, not where I started, but even where I am now, and you going beyond that. Amen. Amen? Amen? It doesn't do good to keep starting over and over again. Yeah. So, now, so therefore, John G. Lake Ministries is the oldest, most experienced, and most successful healing ministry in existence today, and is the acknowledged authority concerning healing and operating in the power of God, Right? Everybody you know, if you name somebody, I can almost guarantee that we trained them. If you, if you can name them and they're known for healing, street healing, whatever, anything else going on, we trained them. They either came to a seminar or they ordered our CDs, DVDs, something, and most of them will give credit to the fact of where they got it to. Some still hide it and act like Jesus showed up in their living room and gave it to them, but <laughs> people like that that don't have integrity and honor, they don't generally last long, yeah. right? And so uh, if, if I quote Dr. Summerall, I tell you, Dr. Summerall said, I don't make it sound like I said it. And if I know who I'm quoting, then I will tell you, or I'll say I don't remember who said it. But this is why, because I believe we need to honor where we get it from, because you might want to go there and get some too. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> and it's good to know. So now, I'm going to have to, uh, oh, no, we're doing good. We're doing real good. Okay. Uh, hmm. I'm looking at the timer and Timer is different than the clock. Okay, so hopefully you have filled out all the paperwork. We'll pick that up. Now, we're going to be in section one. This is page 17 of your manual. That is correct. Is that right? 17? Is that right? Okay. Make sure we've got the same manual. Mine's a little different because I just put it in three-hole punch and put it in a notebook because I like to add notes and papers in between. So this is the introduction to John G. Lake and JGLM. Now, 
I'm not going to go into a whole lot of intricate detail about this. There's a lot about John Lake that's out there. How many of you know who John Lake is? Oh, good. Okay, then I don't have to go into a whole lot of detail anyway. Um, he was a man like anybody else. He did a lot of amazing things, God working through him. He also did some stupid things, right? He was a man, right? And all the women said, amen. No, okay, anyway. Now, okay. So, but he did, he did some amazing things just because he decided to step out. And we'll even talk about some of these things because uh, it was my relationship with his daughter and her husband that actually led me into learning and where to go to find this material and then dig it out. And it laid dormant for over 70 years. And, and it was amazing. It was right there all the time. And some of these things that are now in the manual uh, were actually letters that were written that were in the AG of the Assembly of God archives. And I was told to go up there and pull these letters out. And that's what I did. And amazingly, there were some of the answers. And then some of the things in those letters gave me other clues of other people to look for and look up. And I did. And then that led me uh, eventually down to uh, South Texas where a little woman named Pauline Parham, which was Charles Parham's uh, daughter-in-law. If you don't know who that is, it's not a big deal. But, you know, he was a, basically, well, he wouldn't say he was the founder of the Pentecostal movement. He called himself the projector of it. He, he, he received it and he projected it. He was teaching people. And so she was his daughter-in-law. And I went down to uh, listen to her and to record her, her preaching. And while I was there, uh, I had some names of people in Houston, Texas. And so I went over there and found these people. And then that led me to a manual that John Lake had used to train uh, what he called divine healing technicians. And so... Uh, I'll give you more of the story, more of the details with it later on, but eventually that person, when they passed away, I got the manual in my possession, started going through it overnight, decided to change this, change that in the way I was doing things, and that's when I saw the 50% increase. And then over the next nine months, we began practicing divine healing in our home, and I went out to Walmart, I went to different places, hospitals, uh, just praying for anybody, anywhere, on purpose, in different places, to see if it worked everywhere, right? And so... Uh, but eventually, during that time, uh, people started coming to our home. Uh, we, we lived a little bit out in the country, I guess, not too far, but people would pull up and they would hear about, somebody would tell them, hey, if you need to get healed, you can go to this guy and he'll pray for you and God will heal you. And I had one friend that uh, made his living playing pool in bars and he would go to bars and somebody would mention something and he'd say, oh, well, hey, as soon as we finish this game, I'll take you out to my friend's house and he can get you healed. <laughs> So, and, you know, and two o'clock in the morning, people would be pulling up in our driveway. <laughs> and so, and, and he even slept in his car overnight one night because I didn't know he was out there. And he slept till the next morning and then came in and we ended up going and praying for some people at the hospital. But for nine months in our home, every person that came to our home got healed. Amen. Right? Now, and what that means, now, I'm not saying they all got healed instantly. Sometimes it took two or three visits that they would come back. Every time they'd get better. And you say, why, why only nine months? Because after nine months, I started traveling, and it wasn't all done in my home. And so after nine months, people started asking us to come, and so we would travel and minister uh, all over. And when we started traveling, we saw it. We, we did see the percentage drop a little bit from 100% down to, actually, it dropped initially down about 85%, which obviously troubled me. And then I started looking at why and figured it out with the help of the Holy Spirit. And we tweaked some things and then we got the results back up there. And so uh, what I, the reason I'm telling you this is because this is not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to line you all up and just walk down and lay hands on you and, you know, impart or, uh, you know, give you an anointing or any of that kind of thing. The best impartation you can get is not to have my hands or anybody else's hands on you. The best impartation is for you to sit here three days, hear, listen, study, prove it out in the Word of God, and put it to work in your life. If you do that, that's the impartation you want. Amen? Amen. So, now, um, just to give you some quick history so you can know about it. Uh, John Lake was born March 18th, 1870 in Ontario, Canada. He had 16... Oh, we got a Canadian here. All right, all right. Got a couple of them. That's true, a couple of them. All right. Well, welcome. Some of, our, some of my best friends are Canadians. Amen? Great people. They're awesome people. Uh, some of the funniest people I've met. Okay, I mean, they're just hilarious to be around usually. Okay, so now uh, he had 16 brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not just giving you history. Okay, when I started studying, 
and, and I, I, well, I guess I could back up a little bit. The reason I started studying was because, and, and early on, well, when I was, what, 16, 17 months old, uh, I was playing in the, well, I was at, actually at our, our family reunion, and at one point my dad was leaving. My dad was uh, 18 at the time, I think it was, 18, 19, right, right in there. And he had to leave. It was a big family reunion. And so, you know, the kids were all playing, running around, that kind of thing. And so somehow I, I followed him out to the car, and he didn't know it. And as he got in the car, I went around the back of the car, and he didn't see me. And he backed over me. And when he backed over me, he ran over my head, basically. And it was right near the wheel well. And my hair got caught in the wheel well in the tire in the, in the uh, hub. And it pulled me up into it. And it ripped this ear completely off. It was off and on the ground. And the scalp was ripped from here all the way across to this ear, to the top of the ear. And then so all of this was ripped. And this was all pulled down uh, just above my eyes just because of the pulling. So it wasn't like a cut. It was a rip. And so uh, my dad heard something happening. He didn't know what it was. He got out, looked under the car, and there I was. I was lying still. He thought I was dead. And he ran into the house just panicked and ran in screaming, I've killed our baby, I've killed our baby. And my grandfather, who was a full-blood Choctaw Indian, uh, actually came running out. And I tell you, we were talking about this this morning. I said, I've got, uh, I'm like, you know, 20% Choctaw Indian. I'm like 20% Irish, 20% Gypsy. And, <laughs> and, 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 then I, and I'm like, and, and I know I'm at least 20% Coca-Cola. Right? <laughs> so, at least I'm like, so, okay. As a matter of fact, th that percentage may even be a little higher. Okay. <laughs> so, but uh, he ran out, picked me up, picked up my ear. Thank God he had presence of mind to pick up the ear, right? And put me in his truck and drove. And they only lived about three blocks uh, from the local hospital there. And they took me in. The doctor said that uh, there was nothing that he could do, basically. Uh, they just, he said, he told my, my mom. My mom was 16 years old at the time. Uh, it was just about to turn 17. And he told her, he said, there's nothing we can do. He said, just get ready to bury him. We'll do all we can, but really, all, you know, basically all we can do is try to make him comfortable, but there's way too much damage. So he went in and started doing some surgery, and then my mom went to pray. And she said, God, we dedicate him to you. He's yours. Let him live. If you let him live, I'll dedicate him to you, and I'll train him for you. And so after a good period of time, uh, the doctor came out, and, and he kind of took a little break, and he said, uh, you know, uh, it looks like he might actually live. Uh, but if he does, he will have so much brain damage that in his words, this is, you know, I'm sure this is a medical term, he said he will be a vegetable all of his life. right? And so he went back in to do some more surgery. My mom went back to praying. And she said, God, that's not good enough. If you're going to let him live, let him be normal. Well, there's a whole bunch of controversy over whether I'm normal. <laughs> but, but I'll be honest with you, I've never seen normal do any good for anybody. Right? <laughs> so, so... She been, began praying again, and then after a bit, he came back out again and said, you know, uh, watching the reactions and things and, and all this, uh, so far we haven't seen any signs of brain damage, but even if he, if he doesn't, he will never have any hearing in his right ear. He said, I sewed it back on, but he'll never have any hearing in his right ear, and he'll never have any hair because the scalp was ripped and all that, and he said, he'll never have any hair. He went back in. My mom went back to praying, and so uh, now... And he actually, what that was, uh, well, as I said, I was 17 months old. I'll be 60 in two months, roughly two months, three months. And so he was slightly off about how soon I would die. Okay? <laughs> so, um, and, and as I grew up, amen. Well, and my, um, as, as I grew, my mother taught me how to read using the King James Bible. Uh, because uh, after that accident, I, I mean, I didn't start school right then because they didn't want to, they never let me out of their sight. And, and matter of fact, they had this misperception, and most of my relatives had the misperception that I was spoiled. That is not true. Um, I call it divine favor. So, um, so but he, um, I'll, I'll, I mean, they would talk about how, uh, you know, I never touched the ground. Somebody was always carrying me. Somebody was ever, always picking me up. And, and, and the funny thing was, we were in a small town, and I ran into that doctor regularly. All the time I was going, we moved away from there when I was about eight. So up until about eight, we'd see that doctor regularly. And I don't care where I was at. He would call me over, stop me, grab my head, and start 
looking. <laughs> yeah. And at eight years old, and he goes, yeah, yeah, looks like it took pretty good. I'm like, okay, if it hadn't taken after eight years, it's probably not going to work, you know? So, but he looked at it, and there were 72, he had to do 172 stitches across my head, six hours of surgery, and my head swelled up literally like a basketball. And so they really wondered, you know, if, if there was any damage and things. And so uh, as, as I grew, my mom taught me how to read using the King James Bible in the beginning. She would read me to sleep, and then when I learned to read, I'd read her to sleep, right? And we were talking about it a couple of years ago, and I said, well, you know, Mom, I'm still reading people to sleep with the Bible. You know? <laughs> so, so, but, so as I grew, uh, went in the military, and then while I was in the military, uh, I knew that God had called me early on. I knew that uh, I was supposed to be in ministry. And, but all the things that I went through, I look back now and I go, wow, God was showing me discipline. He was showing me how to, uh, the aspects of discipline, how to discipline my life. And so those things I never regretted going through. Um, and, but whenever I did get out, I knew I was going into ministry. At the time I was, uh, as a job, I was teaching martial arts. And then, uh, again, another aspect of discipline. And then whenever, at, at, basically at one point I told God, I said, whatever you want me to do. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but eventually... I decided, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And for years, it was like I was beating my head against a wall. But now whenever I got married, uh, my wife and I, within, well, our first date was on April 22nd, 1977. We got married on October 10th, 1977. Um, it's kind of funny because our first date, I took her to see a, a movie at a drive-in. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up on the internet. Um, <laughs> but I took her to a movie, and we went and saw A Star is Born. And so on our anniversary last year, that movie was uh, it literally on our anniversary, that movie was re-released, right? And so it was kind of, we still hadn't seen it, but there it is. Anyway, so but we, we talk about it a whole lot, okay? So, but, but then, and it was funny because on our, on our first date, I take her to a drive-in movie, and then uh, we, we, we actually drove from North Texas, uh, well, it's about an hour from here. We drove down to another town um, over in Mesquite, and had pizza, and then on the way back, we took a kind of a back road, and so, you know, the moon was out, it was beautiful, so pull over on the side of the road, and it's pretty, so, you know, it's, we're gonna park. <laughs> so, we park, and my wife is looking at me, and she wasn't my wife yet, but, you know, she's looking at me like, okay, what are you thinking, <laughs> you know? So I reach behind the seat, and I pull out a Bible. <laughs> I started reading the Bible to her, right? Kind of freaked her out. Because <laughs> that wasn't normal. Okay. So, but I, and, and right away I started telling her, I said, you know, I don't know what's going on, but I do know this. God's got a plan for my life. And whatever that's going to be, I don't know. Well, less than six months later, we're walking down the, well, actually, a couple of months later, we're walking down a dirt road, just talking. And I, I, that's where I proposed to her. I was walking down this road, and I said, and my proposal was really romantic. I just told her, I said, look, if you stick with me, we're going to go around the world. I said, I said, I don't know what God has for me, but I know it's bigger than this town. And I said, now, I don't know what all he's got planned, but I do know this. He's got a plan for my life. And I said, and if you stick with me, I said, we'll go around the world. And that was 41 years ago, right? And she's, she's stuck. Amen. <laughs> and so... And, and believe me, it was, you know, not all easy. And my kids and my wife and all this, we've, we've, they, they've, they've paid the price for God's call on my life because they've, they've done things. For me, it was easy, but their call wasn't necessarily my call, so for them it was a little harder for some of the things. And we forget sometimes some of the things that other people pay the price for. You know, uh, when you go to look for John Lake's grave, it's the most visited grave in the Riverside uh, part, uh, Cemetery up in Spokane. And when I went up there, I also looked for his wife's grave because it wasn't next to his because she outlived him by 30 years. And so when I went and asked where, what, where her grave was, they said, you know, you're the first person ever asked. But if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't have any of his sermons because wow. she sat and wrote them all down by hand. She was a stenographer by trade, and she wrote them all down, and people don't give her credit for doing that. Wow. Amen? So many times it's the women behind the scenes or, or the men sometimes behind the scenes uh, if they back women that are in ministry, then you don't always know what the spouse goes through to get that done. So, and then we were married on October 10th. Actually, we were married on October 10th and 15th of 1977. 
uh, we had two weddings or two wedding ceremonies. Uh, one was I was going to work at the uh, Texas Department of Corrections at the Walls Unit down in Huntsville, and they said we're going to call you and we can call you any day. So I told her, I said, look, if you want to get married, we probably need to do it now because if they call me, I'm going to have to go and it's going to offset things. And we had it scheduled for the 15th, and so on the 10th, about real close to midnight, I went to our pastor's house, my pastor's house at that time, uh, knocked on his door. He said, I'll meet you down at the church. My parents were there. My best friend was there. He just got off work at Brahms Ice Cream, still in his white ice cream outfit. <laughs> and we're all standing there in the pastor's office at the First Baptist Church there, and he performed the ceremony. Uh, her mother didn't even know <laughs> until later. And her grandfather was the one that was supposed to do our wedding. And so a week later, I actually was able to be there, and we went through with that ceremony. But when it came time to sign the certificate, that's when her grandfather found out that, you know, that we were already married. But a lot of people had already found out, and they thought something was up. Because at the wedding, everybody on my side of the family already knew. So nobody came. <laughs> so one side, her side is full, my side's empty. And they're all looking like, oh, is he an orphan? Is that what he is? <laughs> so but, so uh, we got married October 10th, uh, 1977. And then on November 17th, 1978, uh, we had our first child, and her name was Erica. And when Erica was born, she was, everything was fine. I mean, literally, the sonograms, all that kind of thing, all that stuff was perfect. No sign of any problem. The pregnancy was a, a good, easy pregnancy. Pregnancy, easy for me to say, yeah. But anyway, it appeared to be an easy pregnancy, okay? But uh, when, when Erica was born, she was born with a hemangioma tumor. And a hemangioma tumor is a tumor that's made up mainly of blood vessels kind of all lumped together. And what made it special with her was that where it was at. Because usually hemangiomas can be somewhere on the body. With her, it was actually in her tongue, which made her tongue about the size of my fist when she was born, and her tongue was outside of her mouth because it was so big she really couldn't pull it back into her mouth. So when you're, this child is born, our first child, and we see this baby born, and then there's this huge red tumor actually in her tongue, and when she's delivered, it, it, it's shocking because there was nothing. There was no sign of anything. And so immediately, uh, the doctor, you know, they're kind of like, okay, you move over and let us do our thing here, and they did all that, and then the doctor said, we're going to schedule a charter a plane to take her down to John C. Lee Hospital in um, Galveston, Texas, and so we flew on a small plane down there. Uh, he put her in an incubator, and from, well, for the first six months, we didn't get to hold her at all. She was always in an incubator, always in, she had, when they put her at the hospital there, they had to put tubes into her lungs because her lungs had collapsed, and so they put tubes into her lungs. Uh, they had to put a, trach a tracheotomy in her throat so that she could breathe. Um, it, and, and they kept telling us, she's probably going to die. She's probably going to die. If for no other reason, then she may actually suffocate. Because even with a trach, her tongue would sometimes cover the trach oh, wow. because it was so big. And so we, we had to do that. My wife had to go through uh, some medical training of how to clean the trach and suction out the trach and what to do and how to do these things. And, they, uh, she, I was actually working at that time, uh, by that time, um, I was actually working up here at Texas Instruments, and whenever she was born, I still had my job, so I would have to go down there on the weekend and then drive back and work Monday through Friday and then drive back to uh, Galveston every weekend. So we were doing that every weekend. My wife had to stay there at the hospital, and there were no places for them to, for, for parents to stay, so she actually had to sleep in the waiting room and she would have to pull chairs together, and at night they would cut the lights down. And during that whole time, literally almost every night, uh, there was a, it was a big room with a lot of babies in it, and almost every night a baby would die. And, and a parent would come running out screaming, jump on the floor, beat their fist, and scream and cry. And my wife lived in that for six months. And I only went down and was in it two days a week of that time. So it was very wearing on her to be there. And so we began praying, saying, God, you know, we gotta do something. And then finally they said, okay, we've done all we can do. Uh, so you need to realize that at some point we're going to let her out. But she has ran up a, uh, was it $186,000 or $180,000 doctor bill back then, which for us it might as well have been $100 because we had nothing. We had no insurance. We had no money. We had nothing. And so we prayed. said, God, we, they're holding our daughter hostage, basically. 
They won't let her out until we make arrangements to pay for this thing. And so that next day, or by the end of that day, uh, the um, Crippled Children's Fund basically came in and said, we will take care of your entire bill if you will let us put her in the AMA Medical Journal and document her case. And we said, done. And so they documented her case and they let us take her home. And so we took her home. And when we took her, I mean, obviously that got me studying healing even more so. And at that point, I was Babdecostal uh, <laughs> because I, I knew there was power. I just didn't know, you know, I knew God could heal, just wasn't sure how to get him to do it. And so we took her home. Uh, they told us if we ever lived more than five minutes away that from a hospital that she would bleed to death if she cut her tongue, which she did several times. And we'd just pray and, you know, put a towel or something on it and then try to get her to the hospital. Miracle after miracle happened. Uh, but... And we started learning. I started going anywhere there was healing teaching. And I started learning. We started putting it into practice. And we started seeing it work. Problem was, it wasn't good enough, and it didn't work fast enough. And so on February 13th of uh, 1981, she passed away. We buried her the next day, which is February 14th, which is Valentine's Day, yeah. which kind of you know, put a taint on Valentine's Day for us for many, many years. And so we buried her, but as we stood there, there was this little white coffin going down the ground. Everybody else had pretty much walked away. They wanted us to leave, but we didn't. And I remember standing there, and it was February. It was cold, and it's actually just about 10 minutes up the road here at the cemetery where she's buried. And so I stood there, and I held my wife's hand, and I said, God, because you have to remember whenever she died, my, by this time I was going to a full gospel church, and I had been told, God heals the sick. He raises the dead. He'll do it. So I said, well, I've been learning healing from all these famous guys. You know, they ought to be able to do something. So I jumped on the phone and started calling everybody. And anybody that I could get a phone number to, their minister or whatever, I called them. And I couldn't get any of the name guys on the phone. Nobody would answer the phone. I'd talk to their secretary, talk to somebody else, but I never could talk to the, to the person. And got upset with that, and that actually, you know, it, it did some damage because I really got upset and because there was nobody there for me. And so I've been, I've been buying all their tapes, buying all these things, and yet they weren't there. And so when we stood at that grave, I uh, had my wife's hand, and, and I made a vow to God. I said, God, there was no man for me when I needed one, but if you will teach me the truth about divine healing, I will be that man for somebody else so that they don't have to have a grave like I do. And so that really launched us. Now I didn't back off the of healing. We went harder after healing. And that I'd heard about John Lake, and that led me to John Lake and to start studying some of the things. I'd heard about Wigglesworth. I'd heard about Amy Simple McPherson, all these people, and they were amazing. But John Lake was the only person that had duplicated himself and actually trained people to do what he did, and they got results like he did, and in some cases, even better results. And so I said, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. These other guys, it might just be a gift, but this guy knows what he's doing because he was able to train people so then I started calling everybody. I even, I, I called Wigglesworth's grandson. I talked to Albert Hibbert, which was his uh, chauffeur. Uh, I, I, anybody that was around anybody, I talked to him. Just a couple of years ago, I met Wigglesworth's granddaughters, and we talked for some time. And, and I've, I've met everybody that was associated with the different families, A. Allen's family, uh, Jack Coe's family. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you heard, but Jack Coe Jr. passed away, I think it was yesterday or the day before. Um, and so... I knew these people, right? And so I started searching, asking questions. But John Lake, there was something about his teaching that drew me because he was so sane and spiritually logical, and it made sense. So I uh, got a hold of his daughter, Gertrude, and her husband, Wilford, and it's a whole bunch more details to it. But after about a... Well, Gertrude passed away actually in 83, but Wilford lived until 87, and he passed away in June of 87. And then uh, just before that, they had been talking before she died. And they, I had been asking questions. So I started making phone calls every week. Every, usually every Monday, I would call them, talk to them for about two or three hours, ask questions. They would answer the questions. I'd spend the week looking up the answers to the questions and that they gave me. And then I'd call back next week for, with new questions. And we did that for several years. And then eventually he said, you know, he asked me my testimony. I told him. He said, what, what day did that happen? Uh, I said, I, I don't know. And he said, well, find out. I said, okay, that's a weird question. I never had anybody ask me what day I got ran over. 
And so <laughs> I, I called my mom and I said, do you by any chance remember the day that I ran over what the date was? She goes, oh yeah, that was September 16th, 1960. I'm like, how do you remember that? She said, there are some days you just don't forget. <laughs> well, I'd lost a daughter, so yeah, I, I totally remember that. And so I said, so I called Wilford back, told him. He said, yeah, that's what I thought. That's what you thought. What do you mean that's what you thought? He said, well, before John Lake passed, he gave a prophecy on uh, May 24th, 1934, of uh, the person that would pick up his ministry and carry it on. And he gave a detailed prophecy. And he said, you fit that. And me and Gertrude had talked about it. And we believe you're the person we're supposed to pass all this to. And so I said, sounds good to me. Send it. I'll take any. I'm, I'm looking for information. I, I wasn't trying to get some type of spiritual airship, okay? <laughs> but uh, they started sending materials, letters, uh, documents, sermons, unpublished sermons, the unedited sermons, uh, all these things, and I started searching them out, and then I also got a list of names, and that's what led me to the person in Houston that actually ended up getting the manual. Uh, and so we, we kept searching all this out, and eventually we started coming to some truth. Now, we're going to have to take a, a real quick break. Come back to you.